So, hello everyone, my name is Eva and this is my first ever talk, so I'm equal parts nervous and excited. Um, but today I want to talk about how we can secure encryption beyond just using really strong algorithms. It might be a bit of a different talk because I'm here just to explore a problem rather than to come up with solutions. So really, I'm just rambling on about what I find really interesting. So a bit about me. Um, I've been in cybersecurity for a couple of years now, so I'm still a newbie. I did a technical apprenticeship. I'm finishing off my master's in cryptography. And here are some of the really interesting um, things I study. So this donut here with all the sprinkles on top, that's an example of elliptic curve um, cryptography which is one of the more resilient cryptography types against quantum computing. I'm not going to bore you with the um, technical details, but I promise it's really interesting. Um, aside from that, I've got a very, very mischievous cat called Misty. I collect ping pong goldfish, and I'm a rugby forward. So quite an interesting life. Um, but it follows that... Through my technical experiences and my academic experiences, the one thing I've learned is that I don't know very much at all. And without sounding harsh, I don't really think anyone does. Um, especially with cybersecurity, it's such an interconnected, massive field. And especially when you come to events like this, it's very overwhelming. You don't know where to look, especially when you're new. But this means that to get an overall idea of your security picture, you're going to rely on multiple people from multiple domains, um, people speaking different technical languages, and this is really complex. And also, even if you did spend all your time researching, the time researching on one subject takes away from researching another, so it's just not feasible to know everything, and that's okay. This also maps quite nicely to a cognitive bias called the Dunning-Kruger effect, which essentially says incompetent people tend to not realize they're incompetent because they're incompetent. And actually, I find this quite reassuring because the fact that I don't think I know very much just shows that I'm a bit self-aware. And I more wanted to put this on to say that everyone has limitations, and actually being aware of your limitations is really powerful. So this leads me on to the problem that I'm doing my talk on, which is although these technical advancements are really interesting and really excitement, they, uh, exciting, they do come with some new problems. So as this technology becomes more and more advanced, we're going to have to rely on more and more people from more and more domains to um, properly develop and implement them. And this isn't a one-to-one -one mapping. It's not as this becomes a little bit more intense, this becomes a bit more intense, because you've got to consider the links between these people and services. So to have a holistic view of our security, which is what we always aim for so we can pick out the weaknesses, we need to access, uh, assess security at and between each stages, and then we need to use that to build systems and processes so that the individual, individuals and links don't become points of failure. And I'm sure you're aware this is a massive task. So on the previous slide, I spoke about different stages, so I thought maybe I would go a little bit more into how we might partition um, an encryption services lifecycle. So first of all, encryption relies on mathematics. So imagine a big university, loads of cryptographic experts are crowded around a whiteboard and it's full of loads of symbols no one really understands and bad handwriting. This is where the mathematics is derived. So this here is an example of what we call textbook RSA, which is essentially just RSA we use to it back but it still relies on uh, the prime factorization of really large numbers. Again, at this point, this is the only stage where you have to worry about the mathematics, and I'm not going to go into mathematics here because I know no one really wants to hear about it. But next, once the mathematics is determined, it's packaged, packaged up and it's sent over to the software developers. And here, they pass it on, and then software developers in hoodies alone in their bedrooms will hunch over their computers until the early hours of the morning. And they will turn the algorithms into a usable product. Again, I'm really simplifying here because there's so many different aspects to um, you know, actual coding. There's the architects, there's the assurance. But for the sake of keeping this within 15 minutes, the algorithms are now turned into a usable product. 
So now we can flip over to the, um, the customer side. So imagine we've got a big company, they've got a lot of money, they've got a big shiny office in a high-rise apartment in London. They had a security breach last year and they're ready to put some money and time into their cybersecurity practices. They will employ cyber technicians to research services, um, install them, uh, configure them, you know, maintain them, and then eventually remove them. Um, at this point, we'd like to think they're doing some form of security checks as well. But now they've taken the usable product and they've configured it for local devices. And finally, they're used by the end users. And at this point, there won't be really much interaction between the end users and the cryptographic services. Um, this is an example of connecting via SSH. The end user would probably just see the public key. Most likely, you will not really understand what's going on behind the scenes. But they'll say yes, and then they'll be connected. So the reason that I go through it like this is because I quite enjoy looking at problems when it's kind of broken down into chunks. And this gives quite a nice flow diagram. So again, to be holistic, we want to make sure that every stage is secure. Because what a lot of people tend to think when they come to cryptography is, oh, we need to make it resilient to quantum computing. And in reality, putting all of your efforts up here and not really putting enough efforts in here and here is far less secure than having a uniform approach where you distribute all your efforts evenly. Um, so I'll give an example of where things can go wrong. Oh, here we go. And these are downgrade attacks. So downgrade attacks are where you kind of spoof, not spoof, you overload um, a server so it rolls back to an encryption method or a service that is exploitable. Hackers are lazy, and we all know this. Why would you spend years trying to break a really hard encryption service when you can just exploit something in seconds? So one example of a downgrade attack, which I found really interesting, was with the um, US military drones. US military drones. Um, I think it was 2012, and Iran managed to capture a military drone from the US. Now, Iran claimed that they'd managed to break the really strong PY military encryption, but this was never proved, and it's a massive, massive claim, so I'm skeptical, and you can make your own opinions. But one way that they could have done this was if they managed to have a successful downgrade attack. Now, I don't know if this is still how GPS works, but at the time, um, GPS signals were sent over two radio frequencies. So radio frequency number one was used for civilian access code, and then one and two together were used for the secure military PY code. Now, originally, the GPS was intended to be used over the military code, but if you could overload that military um, code and jam the encryption altogether, then by default, the drone would run as autopilot and it would use the civilian access code. And that is 10 times weaker, if not more. So if they were able to do a downgrade attack, they'd be able to much easier spoof those GPS coordinates and get the drone, uh, get the drone to prematurely land in, in Iran. And I think that's much more likely. But again, if you have done a downgrade attack, why not just say that you've done the more impressive one? <laughs> So here is an example of really, really uh, military-grade encryption, but it's just not properly implemented a little bit. Um, and that means that it can be completely um, taken down. So it's just an example of it's really important to have uniform security throughout. Um, another example of this might be uh, SSH keys. So again, I'm not sure if it's still the case, I know a couple of years ago, by default, your um, private SSH key would just not be password protected unless you configured it. And that's an implement uh, implementation error as well. Um, I don't think I have much time left, so I'm pr quickly going to go over some side channel attacks. We all know that you can never be properly secure, and you've got to stay realistic. So you might have really strong algorithms, you might have um, really secure coding, you might have a really excellent implementation team, and you might your users will just use it. Um, 
take an example, you had a suspected command center and an attacker was able to see that loads and loads of information was coming in and out. They can't break the encryption, it's really strong encryption, but they know there's a lot of communication there. They're not interested in what it says. They're just going to want to deny access. So even though in these cases, absolutely everything is perfect and kind of an output of actually using the service is vulnerable. So we actually need to stay realistic. And even in cases where we have to just accept the risks, we need to consider them. So this is another reason why I think a model like this is really useful. <laughs> so one of the big problems that we face in our, the company I work for at the moment does a lot of work about cross domains. So we look into how can we show the in cyber picture in the intelligence picture. And working across domains is really, really difficult. You have overlapping terminology, you know, the hyperconfabulating void effect where no one really knows what it's on about, but it sounds impressive. Um, we have translator bottlenecks. Not many people are an expert in cybersecurity and in intelligence. Those people are expensive and rare, and it takes time. So I'm not going to go into too much detail. I'm just going to leave that there. But the point I'm making here is you need to consider both these points and the links between them. And because of this, I'm hesitant to call this a framework. Um, basically, to get a holistic view, you can't just look at that, look at that, look at that, look at that. You have to look at the relationships and dependencies within them. So this means you can't think of it like a to-do list. You have to think of it like an active system. So I'd encourage everyone, um, when they're looking at their holistic cyber picture, to look into systems thinking techniques. This is another topic I could spend hours talking about, but it's really, really useful. And we need to question how we're thinking about how we're thinking about cyber, especially with encryption. So finally, because I know I've probably been speaking for too long, I just wanted to have a nod for security as a disabler, especially within cryptography. So with cryptography, everyone puts emphasis on, you know, having codes that can take um, brute force attacks for 10 hundred years. When in reality, if we only want to secure a message for amount of time, for example, if the message might be shoot that man over there in the next minute, we only want to secure it for a minute because once that man's dead, they know what the message was. So in that case, there's no point in, you know, employing cyber uh, encryption that will take 10 years. And one really nice example of this is that tanks don't have keys. I was quite shocked when I found this out. It turns out in the same way that if someone can run through a battlefield, um, get through all of the physical defenses, manage to clamber actually into the tank and do the strange setup to actually take the tank, they deserve the tank. And also <laughs> having keys is a bit useless anyway, because what if two people had keys and one of them died over there and one of them died over there? then you'd be left without a tank and you'd have to send more people to get the keys. So <laughs> throughout this talk, I've been saying good enough encryption rather than strong encryption. And actually, in many cases, good enough is better than completely secure. So thank you for letting me ramble on. I hope there was something in that. Um, I've just been talking about what I find interesting and I hope you find it interesting too. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.